Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Today we're uh, happy to have with us our adopted seminary student, Michael Stein, and uh, there will be a door offering for him following the service, uh, and then he will be uh, leading the Bible class this morning uh, with a Bible study plus things about himself, so all are welcome to come and share those moments in the Trinity Room. And there will be a special voters assembly on Tuesday, June 25th at 7 p.m. to discuss purchasing the property on Oak Street. And next Sunday, uh, the 30th at 10, the 10:30 service, we will honor Pastor Gall's anniversaries and retirement with a special worship service and a potluck meal following. Uh, and be sure to stop in the atrium today to fill out an RSVP card so they'll know how many are coming. Uh, and Sunday, uh, today, from 8 this morning till noon, the American Red Cross uh, uh, is giving cardinal t-shirts to all presenting uh, donors, and they want to collect 18 pints. And if you happen to be a Cub fan, just go ahead and give some blood, and take the shirt, and sell it to a cardinal fan. Uh, the Golden Eagles meet this week, and so be sure and uh, sign up uh, today if you plan to attend. And, uh, and you will find the sign-up sheet also posted uh, on the bulletin board for Holiday World and the stockholders dinner as well. And so you're asked to please uh, sign up if uh, you want to participate in that. Let us begin our worship service.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this world we are surrounded by enemies, but Christ sets us free. Sin has enslaved us all, but Christ forgives us. We deserve death for our sinful lives, but Christ is risen and will rise us as well. We are vulnerable to the attacks of Satan, but Christ is present and protects us. In Eden, our first parents listened to the voice of Satan and disobeyed the voice of God. By their actions, they allowed sin and death into the world. We have continued in their footsteps, enslaved to sin, bound to die, and all too often captive to the voice of Satan. Let us go before our God and Father confessing our sins and asking him for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are in captivity to sin. We are powerless to overcome death. On our own, we are no match for the power of Satan. For the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive our sins, free us from our enemies, restore our broken relationships with you and with one another. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die and rise for you that your sins may be forgiven, that death would be destroyed, and that Satan would be defeated. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are freed from our enemies. We are freed to serve in God's kingdom. Be my rock and my a refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Though you have made me see troubles many and bitter, you will restore my life again from the depths of the earth. You will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once more. I will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, my God. I will sing praise to you with the lyre, Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have delivered. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long for those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and confusion. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Cast out all sins and evil desires from us and pour into our hearts your Holy Spirit to guide us into all blessedness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this day is found written in Isaiah chapter 65, beginning at verse 1. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, Here am I, here am I. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you, 
Such people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day. See, it stands written before me. I will not keep silent, but will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps. Both your sins and the sins of your ancestors, says the Lord, because the burned sacrifices on the mountains and, defy, and defied me, <clears throat> because they burned sacrifices on the mountains and defied me on the hills, I will measure into their laps the full payment for their former deeds. This is what the Lord says. <clears throat> and when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes and people say, don't destroy it, there is still a blessing in it. So will I do in behalf of my servants. I will not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah. Those who will possess my mountains, my chosen people will inherit them. And there will be, and there will my servants live. This is the word of the Lord. Praise God. And the epistle reading is found written in the book of Galatians chapter 3. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or f and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we are under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. Please rise. Uh, Alleluia. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 8th chapter. <clears throat> Wait to you, O oh Lord. They sailed to the region of the Gersenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had worn clothes, no clothes, uh, or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this to the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. 
When they came to Jesus, they found the man with, from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gersenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <clears throat> of Jesus. Amen. I'm glad to get to be with you this morning and whenever Pastor Forthgang contacted me, we set up some dates. I got really excited whenever I saw the reading for today because 
This Galatians reading from chapter 3 was my confirmation verse. And so these, these passage really has special meaning to me because I think in verse 29, it's really the linchpin, the whole crux of the argument Paul has for why the Gentiles are the children of God. So who are the heirs of promise that he mentions? Is it a select group of people? Was it someone based on an ethnic heritage or a lineage? Or is there something else that God had in mind whenever he said who would be his heirs? See, Paul wrote this letter of Galatians to an area, to a region in what is modern-day central Turkey. Most of his other letters, like Paul, uh, Romans and Ephesians, were written to individual towns. But this was written to an area, an area where Paul and Barnabas had come preaching the good news and converting many. And those Gentiles believed who they were baptized, and they trusted fully in Christ for their salvation. Yet there was a group that followed Paul, and it seemed they went behind him. Every town that he went to, they were right behind coming in, preaching and, and polluting this pure gospel that they had just preached. This group was the Judaizers, and they believed that faith in Christ wasn't enough. You also had to put yourself under the law. You had to be circumcised. You had to follow all the law of Moses in order to be saved. Faith wasn't enough. You also had to have some works in there. And I think this just drove Paul crazy that these people were following him and, and everyone heard this message and listened to him. In the first chapter of Galatians, he, he writes to the people, he says, he begins by saying, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. So that's what he wrote this letter, this Paul's letter of Galatians, was to contradict and to, to fight against these Judaizers who were polluting the faith in Christ. And he really put forth two choices to the people. Salvation by faith or salvation by following the law. He begins in verse 23, and I think he makes this stark claim something that the Judaizers just couldn't believe. He says, we are, we're held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So that's what Paul was really talking about whenever he says we were held in custody. We were something that wasn't a gospel at all to go put themselves back under the law. You see, the law was an overseer. It was a kind of prison warden, or as Paul puts it in verse 24, a guardian. The Greek word that's used here for guardian is pedagogus. And that's a word that we still have today in pedagogy. Pedagogue. We may be familiar with this idea of, of a teacher. A pedagogue is someone who teaches a group and he teaches uh, students. Usually it's a strict, stiff, old-fashioned kind of educator. I, I think it brings to mind the idea of those, you remember the old Looney Tunes cartoons whenever they'd have a teacher type person, he'd always be in his cap and gown still walking around with a ruler to whack the kids over the, over the knuckles whenever they did anything. This idea of just a strict teacher. And while that's similar to the idea of a, a pedagogue in, in Paul's day, it's not quite the same. See, the, this illustration would have been much more meaningful to the, his original hearers because it carried a different connotation. Pedagogue was usually an older slave hired by the family, or owned by the family, I should say, who was sent to, entrusted with the overseeing the young son. He took care of the son, he took him back and forth to school, making sure that he behaved properly. He did what he was told, making sure that he uh, actually went to school, I guess you could say. So the pedagogue wasn't really a teacher in the strictest sense of the word, but rather he was just this kind of escort, 
someone who made sure that this young boy would be kept in the proper line of the family. So he, over, he kept accompanying this son everywhere he went, making sure that he did what he was told. And life under this guardian was completely controlled and curtailed, so much so that this child was under this guardian supervision. And often this guardian would have to discipline the child whenever he got out of line. And that discipline would be strict and, and, and harsh. And this child just longed for the day that he would finally be free to live his own life away from this pedagogue. See, in the Roman Empire, the child didn't have the kind of freedom that we have today. The child was really seen as kind of like a slave. That's what he's talking, Paul talks about in chapter 4, that the child was seen as, as having no rights. And even though he may be the future inheritor of the family's vast fortune, he still had no say in what he could do. He had no say in what he did in his life. He could make no decisions and had no freedom. So from about the age of six up until about 17, the child was under this, this pedagogue. Whenever he could finally be free, the freedom came because his father deemed him ready. And so they'd have a, a coming of age ceremony where the father would bring the son out and, and publicly adopt him as his full rightful heir. And the pedagogue would be put away and the son would have become the true inheritor of all the fortune that the family had. This, this is what Paul is clarifying there in verse, this chapter 4. He uses this image of the pedagogue to describe life under the law. That was no gospel at all. He says the law served as this pedagogue, this disciplining overseer, until the time set by the Father who, through the redemptive life of Jesus, Jesus born of a woman, born under the law, now we become God's children and are adopted into his family. No longer a slave, but God's true child. And since his child, your daddy, your Abba, your father, has made you an heir centered in Christ, and how do we do this? How does this happen? Where is this public declaration that the Father has making us his heirs? Well, that happens at baptism. At baptism, the faith and the trust in God's promise comes to us, the same faith that Abraham had so long ago. In baptism, we die to ourselves. We're washed in the water and the blood of Christ, and we are made as white as snow. And as Jesus said, one who believes and is baptized will be saved. In baptism, we're delivered from sin, death, and the devil. The power, the benefit, and the real purpose of baptism is that we are united with Christ in his life, in his death on the cross, and in his resurrection from the tomb. In baptism, we are clothed in Christ, as Paul says in verse 27. So if by faith we are connected with Christ, we become Abraham's seed. We are heirs according to the promise, not by keeping the law, but by our faith in Christ Jesus. So God's chosen children are not confined to some geographical area or some ethnic heritage. We're not a, a heir of God because of our, we are in Abraham's family tree. But as Peter says in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 7, he says, So the honor is for you who believe. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You see, God called you in your baptism, and he has made us his chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, this holy nation, through faith in Christ Jesus. So we are his beloved children and recognize as heirs to welcome us into heaven through our faith in Jesus. So now that we are free from this custodial care and guardianship of the law, does that mean we're free to live however we want? Or does that mean 
that this being God's heir, does that imply a certain way that we should live? Should we live set apart from the world and should our lives show that we are new creations in Christ? So I invite you to think about this image of being God's child, this image of being clothed in Christ. What does that say to you about how we should live our Christian life? What are some ways that this freedom, this responsibility as God's children can be shared with others? One way is, is in your work life. Work as though you're working unto the Lord. And in school, be kind with those who are in your class with you. Honor them and treat them with respect. Be a good neighbor, you know, mow their lawn. Think of something small and practical just to live out this life of Christ that we have. Help them carry in their groceries. Something, just live this love, life of love. Because that's really what Jesus told us to do, right? The two great commandments. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So that love should just overwhelm our lives and it should overflow outside of these walls and into our everyday life with everyone. Paul tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Let these things overwhelm in our lives and let the world know that we are Christians by our love. You know, I'm reminded of some of the residents that I, where I work. I work at a, a senior living center and, and some of these residents have been lifelong Christians and even whenever they get into the advanced stages of Alzheimer's and dementia, you can still talk with them and just the joy that is on their face, the smile that comes from being an adopted child of God. I'm also reminded of, of Christians in far off lands where it's illegal to be a Christian. And you can read about how even whenever they're arrested and put in jail, they still carry this love of Christ and their captors, their prison wardens, their guards are often converted to Christ because of how they live. They just live in love. And these, it, that confuses their, their captors because how can you love someone who has you arrested? How can you show them grace and love? But it's because of their faith in Christ that overwhelms in their life. Paul finish, or Peter, back in 1 Peter, he finishes that, that quote from uh, 2 verse 9. He says that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into this marvelous light. So Jesus calls us into this light so that our light may shine before the world and, and that they will see our good works and they will glorify our Lord and our Father. So I invite you this week to go forth and show, show to your neighbor, to your boss, to your friends, to your whole community, that you are an adopted, beloved child of God. Not on your merit or because of your perfect keeping of the law, but because of the good work of Christ. Christ gives us his spirit that we might be heirs to the promise, that we might have the right to call him Abba, our Father. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus be with your spirit, brothers and sisters, today and throughout the week. Amen. We now receive our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Dear Heavenly Father, place your wise hand upon all the nations of the earth. Give them leaders who seek after justice and peace. And lead all people to the freedom of your gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, lift up all those who are weighed down by the guilt and shame of sin. Release them from their bondage and point them to forgiveness as, as the, at the feet of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, walk with those who are grieving in the shadow of death. We ask that you would look upon the families of Ruby Gessler and also Glenn Lewis who were called from this life and comfort them with the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, strengthen all who are fighting against the power of Satan. Remind them of your presence in your word and sacraments. Empower them to resist Satan's lies with the truth of your word. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, give hope to all who are isolated and lonely. Bring them into the presence of the loving community of your church that they find help and hope among your people, Lord, in your mercy. Look, look with favor upon all who are sick, injured, and recovering. Be with Pastor Gall in regards to his heart issues and diabetes. Be with Beulah Ziegler, Justin Norris, Rebecca Belcher, Marvin Tappendorf, Vi Kirchhoff, and Nancy Onisorge and Brett Cool, uh, who are recovering uh, from their illnesses. Be with Ellen Tinges, who has medical issues, and Bob Miller, who is in the hospital. And we thank you for uh, giving the diagnosis of cancer-free for Keith Barnes. And we ask that you would look upon all others among our friends and neighbors and family who are suffering various kinds of illnesses. Have mercy upon them and heal them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, send your people to every corner of the earth with your gospel message at all <clears throat> who do not know the saving power of your son's death and resurrection. Hear the good news of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we ask, O Lord, that you would also look upon Reverend John Schultz, uh, who is considering the call to be senior pastor here at St. John's and who has the call to remain at his present congregation. Fill him with your spirit. Give him guidance and wisdom in the decisions that he make. May it be according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And whatever else we have upon our hearts and minds, we bring to you in the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly right, good, uh, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Everlasting God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and, by, and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom. In the peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his favor upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Again, we thank Michael Stein, seminary student, for being with us today. He's on Vicarage, uh, probably till what, August? Yep, mid-August. And then he will do his last year of seminary uh, and be then receive his call. Uh, and today we will have a door offering to help with expenses and that. would ask that he and his family uh, be with us at the door and you'll have the opportunity to welcome him. And if you would like to hear more uh, about his life and in the Bible classroom, uh, you're invited to come to the Bible class. Grant each other the peace of Christ.